going to divert, but it's all going to fit together. I want to talk a little bit about restoration today, if you don't mind. And we've been talking in the flood series, if you can put that up. We've been talking about flood and how God can make something good come out of something that looks uh, so challenging. You know, the first week we talked about God's word in a flood. Do you remember God's word in a flood? There were three R's. I'm just reminding us. Those three R's. The first R was remember. Everyone say remember. remember. Whenever God does something or allows something to happen like we've experienced, something more is taking place than what we see with our natural eyes. Remember that. Remember. Remember. More is at work than what you think you see with your eyes. Number two was the word R, refuse. We refuse to give up. We refuse to throw in the towel. We refuse to be discouraged. We refuse to be disappointed. We refuse. There are many things that we cannot control, but one thing we can control is whether we quit or not. And then the third R word was the word what? Receive. We're receiving the mantle. We're receiving the mandate that we will become the standard of being a manifested son or daughter of God, that he has something he wants to do in a people that will be a manifestation of all the possibilities that God has for his people. That was work one, uh, week one, excuse me. Week two, we talked about why rebuild. We talked about uh, Nehemiah and his rebuilding and that no matter how futile it looks to rebuild. And I received that word, uh, Bishop, when you said 24, 16, 8, 0. I believe that. I believe this was the last rebuild. But even if it were not the last rebuild, how many of you know we keep rebuilding? Yes. We keep rebuilding because God always has a place that he points to that is his protection, remember, his promise, his presence, and his purpose. And that's why Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, because the world needs to see a tangible expression of what God can do in the earth in a people that live all out for him. And so the Lord is using this piece of property in a very paradoxical way to communicate some things to Charleston. And people may think us foolish. They may think that uh, there's futility or that uh, somehow or another we are finished. How many of you know the Bible says that a good man, a righteous man, may be knocked down six times, but seven times he shall arise. And we shall arise, and we will keep arising. And God is opening this floodgate to fulfill his plan for revival and for reformation. And so I want to talk in these last moments on uh, what I was just stirred late last night. I was genuine when I said I was going to be in Ephesians. And I did say Ephesians this morning, so I guess I'm partially being truthful. But I want to talk about how man rebuilds, but God restores. Man rebuilds, but God restores. Can I read some passages out of Haggai? Will you post that on the screen? The book of Haggai, chapter 2. And let me just read this, all right? And you can read along. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Is that feeling relevant right now? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And what? Work. Work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts, and the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Man rebuilds, 
but God restores. In this book of Haggai, the Jews are what we call post-exilic. What that means is, is they are no longer in exile. They're no longer in captivity. They're coming back to their promise and they're starting to rebuild things. Uh, we read from Nehemiah last week where we saw that they had to rebuild the wall. But prior to the rebuilding of the wall, they also had to consider what they were going to do about the temple. And so they were going to rebuild the temple as well because God always has a house. And I agree, I agree that, that bricks and mortar are not what constitute a church. People constitute a church. But God uses bricks and mortar by which to identify at times his address and dwelling place. And there are reasons to have things like temples, churches, buildings, because they are tools, they are conduits through which God works in his people, which are rightly defined as his church. But the people now, the Jews now in our, in our book of Haggai are wanting to rebuild the temple, but they're discouraged. They're discouraged because it's taking a lot longer than they anticipated. It's taking a lot of energy that they didn't have to give. They're facing opposition. It's been like 16 years in trying to rebuild this temple and it's not completed and it's really just sitting there about half done. And so because of the time period and all of these factors, the people were beginning to focus their attention upon their own interests. Now you can't really fault people for this because they have to go on too. They have aspirations, they have desires, they have their homes, they have their futures, they have their families. And so you can't totally blame them after 16 years that they're turning their attention to those things that are most personal to them. But hear me when I say this, that there are moments God says it's appropriate for you to focus upon your own personal attentions for he's a personal God and he, he's working in your personal life. But God also has things that he wants to do corporately. And when he does this corporately, he asks of us at times to turn our attention from that which is ourselves and begin to turn it toward that which has to deal with all of us corporately and what his plans are. And it was exactly that that was going on in Haggai's time. In fact, after 16 years, as we understand it historically, there was famine and there was lack. The people were crying out to God as to why there was this famine and lack in the land. And Haggai begins to speak to them. The whole book really is written in this regard. He was speaking to them saying, it's because you have neglected that which should have come first before you tended to that which may have more naturally come to you. And so the Lord begins to remind them through Haggai, he says this, you are to rebuild, but the Lord says, I am the one who will restore. Rebuilding is your job. Restoring is God's job. You see, God isn't obligated to restore until we are committed to rebuild. Listen to me. Pastor Fred, this is really an important key. You see, until we're willing to rebuild the concepts that you shared, God isn't obligated to restore it until we're ready to put our hand to it and work at it. If we rebuild, God restores. I want you to hear this. If you See, God will never restore your marriage until you're ready to rebuild your marriage. What are you going to do to rebuild it? Every, we all want God to restore things to us, but maybe rebuilding means I got to go to counseling or I got to get help or I got to, I got to do this. If you won't rebuild, God's not obligated to restore. Are you hearing me? Yes. We want things from God to be restored, but hear me, he restores when he sees us committed to rebuilding. They want his presence. They want his blessing. They want his prosperity. They want all of these things and God's prepared to restore, but he says, I don't have to restore anything unless you rebuild it. I tell you, there's a lot to chew on with that. So God is going to restore, but he's asking us, will you rebuild? Remember, Job lost it all, but God restored him. God restored Job. But is it not interesting that God did not restore Job until the Bible tells us that Job prayed for his friends, until Job was ready to begin rebuilding some things like his prayer life, 
and, and maybe a relationship. Until Job was prepared to rebuild, God was not obligated to restore. Joel said that God will restore the years. And he goes through that the, that the swarming locust and gnawing locusts and the canker worm, he said, I'll restore it all. I'll restore the years to you. And we all preach out of Joel and we say, yes, praise God, he's going to restore the years. But read, O oh shouter, what God says prior to the restoration passages. When we come and we repent and we call a sacred assembly and we consecrate a fast and we weep between the porch and the altar, if you will rebuild some things, I will restore some things, says the Lord. In fact, God will restore the blessing on Israel. But Haggai tells them, before I'll restore the blessing, you're going to need to rebuild the temple because I have to inhabit something. And if you'll rebuild it, I'll restore it. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about restoration because here's what I believe. I believe in the natural. I believe there's some natural things that are being rebuilt. And I believe there are some spiritual things that are being rebuilt. And I believe that if we'll be faithful to this, that God will restore what he has promised through the years he would do. But I want you to be sure you understand restoration. How many of you here, and probably affects more ladies than men, but it may, may affect some men as well, but, but my wife in particular is an HGTV addict. <laughs> do I have any other addicts that are willing to admit that? Do we have, oh, I see a few, few addicts are back there going, okay, my, my name, my name is Tracy Baird. <laughs> And I'm an addict. <laughs> she loves HGTV. She loves them all. She loves buying, you know, buy your own island and buy, buy, buy the islands. And buy, uh, there's not a one she doesn't watch. She likes. Okay. All right. All right. So I don't want to embellish, but I, I don't know which one she does or doesn't. I just know that it seems like the channel's always on something on HGTV. But it's interesting when you're watching an HGTV, especially the house flipping ones, which are really interesting to me, because they take something, that house that's run down, and uh, basically they, they want to update it. I, I always find it interesting that we're kind of in an era where everyone wants to get involved in flipping. Uh, my wife's also going to real estate school, and there are a lot of people getting their real estate license because they're going to go into flipping homes and they're going to make their millions because you can flip a house in about an hour. Don't you know that, don't you? About one hour, you can flip a house. I got a feeling there's going to be a lot of disappointed people that come out of that class and start flipping homes. But you know how it is. It's, a, it's an old home. It's run down. It needs updating. Uh, it's contemporary. And, the, and they want to flip it for profit. Now, now that's good, but, but sometimes it doesn't really change all that much because it's a contemporary home and, and they may have to bring it up to code and some things. But I think what's really interesting is when they go to historical homes, especially here in Charleston, because we live in a historical area. And, and many of you know that you can't go downtown and restore something historical unless you get appropriate uh, permitting, appropriate approval. You have to get architectural review. You have to do all kinds of things which is why there are a lot of old homes in our city that are still sitting there dilapidated because you have to have quite a bit of money to go in there because you, you just can't renovate it. You just can't restore it any old way you want. You have to restore it in an appropriate way. And not only do you have to restore it in an appropriate way, but you have to restore it so it's historically accurate, but it also has to be up to current code. It has to be like the original, but yet at the same time, as it resembles the original, it has to be up to speed in all of today's codes and all of today's applications. Now, I, I tell you that because when you go to restore a historical house, you're not restoring it as it was in that day. You're actually restoring it better than it was in that day. So I buy a house downtown, let's say that's a 1720 house, and I have to restore it and renovate it. So I'm going to do everything according uh, to code to make that look a lot like it looked in 1720. But actually, what I'll end up having to do is I'll have to make it better than 1720 
because we're not going to be able to cook in it like they did in 1720. There's going to be an HVAC unit in that house. I'll guarantee you, if it's my house, there will be an HVAC unit in it. And it's going to cool. It's going to heat. There's going to be appropriate electrical wire. In fact, when that house is done, if I do it appropriately and properly, that house is going to be better than the original. Are you following me? Haggai said this. He said, you're discouraged. Uh, it's taken longer than you expected. Uh, what does it look like to you now when you consider how it looked years ago? And, and how many of you know time does something weird to your brain? I start thinking about years ago, and I remember growing up. I was born, today's my birthday, by the way. Happy birthday to me. I'm 58 years old, which meant, you know, I was born in 1959. I remember the 60s. I remember cars when they didn't really have air conditioning. I remember when there was only an AM radio. I remember when there were three channels on the television set. You know, there were two that you got pretty good, and then you had a UHF channel. Anybody remember UHF, where you had to kind of do it, and you put the tin foil on the thing, and you're, you're, you're trying, and you get your sister to hold that so you could watch, you know, Saturday morning wrestling or something that was going on there? And I, so I remember, the, but there's something in your mind that always longs for that day. Just to says, boy, you know, those were really good days. I wish I could go back. Can I just tell you, they weren't that great. No, no, not really, when you think about it. They weren't that great. I, I, we forget about the sweating. Those of you here in the South, do you remember, I, how many of you lived in the South when people didn't have air conditioning? I mean, you sweat, didn't you? Can you imagine? I can't imagine living in Charleston in the summertime without air conditioning. I am so glad God dropped me in Charleston in the dispensation of AC. I mean, I, did, I can't imagine. He knew what I needed to come to Charleston. I needed an AC. But hear me. He says, what is this to you? That's what the Lord is speaking through Haggai to the people. He's saying, you're longing for something that you think you really want. But the fact of the matter is that I want to restore something better than you can even imagine it. That's what restoration means. He said, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. So when God restores, we're not recovering simply what we had. We're receiving more and greater than we could imagine. Says in Ephesians 3.20, here I am, I'm quoting Ephesians again. I told you I would be there. What does it say in that 20th verse, third chapter? That God is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. So I want everyone to hear me. Listen to Bishop when he shares about the city church and as, he, as he's labored in this area. Listen to this. We are, we are not recovering what was we're not recovering what abundant life was. We're not recovering what legacy was. We are being restored into something more. God is restoring us into that which we have not yet to see. Amen. And what is he asking us to do? He's asking us to rebuild. That's our part. So he can restore. That's his part. Now, I'm going to give you, just real quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, and this is not exhaustive, so there may be more to be added to it that you just won't hear today. But there are just four things that I just felt like are real simple things that God is asking. He's at least asking me to rebuild. I'm asking you to join with me in rebuilding these things in order that we might see the restoration of some of the things Bishop put out to us. If we will rebuild in these areas, God will restore those areas. So number one is this. We have to rebuild, and I believe this is a pillar, we have to rebuild the priority of corporate praying. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I, I want you to commit with me. And we had such a great group here today. Thank you so much for being here. But I'm just going to put out the challenge to everybody. We don't do Sunday school in our circles anymore, do we? Maybe we should, but we don't. So we don't have, you know, Sunday schools anymore. We disciple on other nights of the week. And so we really have some time. And 945 really isn't that early. And, and can I just challenge you, would you come and let's just let corporate prayer become a part of our culture. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If we're going to see some things restored, prayer is going to have to fit in here as an important virtue. And let's just prioritize 
coming together. Do you pray? Sure, you pray. All of you pray. You pray on your way to work. You pray in your personal devotional times. You pray family altars. I know people pray, but there's something when the church comes together to pray that's different. And, and that's a pillar that we need to rebuild, that we corporately pray together. So I just want to put, whether you call it a challenge or an exhortation, hey, we'll still love you. Nobody's taking attendance. If you can't be here, I, I'm not looking for you to be, you know, get on a guilt wagon, but I am asking you to say, hey, are we going to rebuild a pillar of corporate praying so that we can see God restore that which is better than we've ever seen? Think about that. The priority of corporate praying. Number two is this, passionate praise and worship. This is a pillar I want us to just rebuild, that we're going to begin to sing with everything that's in us. We're going to worship God with everything we've got. We're going to be a demonstrative people that worships him. Praise is a verb. Worship is a verb. It's, it's when we just express our adoration to God. And, and our church needs to be a church. When people come in, they say they're loving God with everything they've got. And so week after week after week, even if you've had a bad week, in fact, here's how it ought to work. If you have a bad week, everyone else ought to be able to come in and be worshiping passionately. And you come in and say, you know what? These guys are lifting me up. We all can't have a bad week at the same time, can we? I, I would hope not. But even if we were, we need to shake it off and say, I'm coming to worship God passionately, praising and passionately worshiping him. I commend you today. This was a great day of worship and it touched my heart. We appreciate, appreciate that very much. The third pillar is the pillar of preaching and teaching the word. Now, I understand a church must have ministries, and we are beginning to uh, rebuild those ministries, rebuilding the kids' ministry, rebuilding the youth ministry, rebuilding the men's, the women's, the discipling arms. We're rebuilding all of these ministries, and this is important. But hear me when I say that one of the pillars of the church is that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching in order to accomplish His will in the earth. There's something about preaching that happens, that ignites and energizes and unleashes and enlarges. And so we've got to be here for the preaching and the teaching of the word. Sometimes we preach, sometimes we teach, sometimes we do both. But this is a pillar that we must rebuild. And then finally, number four, and these were just things that God just was downloading into me. Four is the power of our spirit-filled distinctives. I am unapologetically Pentecostal. I don't apologize for it anymore. You know, there was a day when people would ask, hey, what church do you go to? Yeah, we go to this church. And oh, yeah, what kind of church is that? Uh, we're a Pentecostal church. church. Because there was almost like this, this embarrassment to it. I'm not embarrassed about it anymore. It's the really, really our distinctive is what the world needs. This world needs the power of the spirit. I am highly involved in reformation. I am highly involved with engaging the culture. I am highly involved with looking at government officials at times and exhorting them to do the will of God. And I have come to this conclusion. At first, I was a little lost in this thing because I thought you had to kind of meet them at sort of the minds level. I'm telling you, they're not that smart. I've been with most of them. I've been with some, if I could tell you their names, your eyes would probably glaze over. I'm telling you, they're not that bright. They're not that smart. They really don't know all that they're doing. Listen, our country has been run by people who have degrees from Harvard and Yale and Ivy League schools, and our country is in a mess. It has nothing to do with how smart you are. It has everything to do with the power of God. And it's taken me a while to get there, but finally I've been in it enough where there's a confidence, I would suppose, or at least a comfortability that I've reached the place where it has nothing to do with can I banter with them on this intellectual level. It has everything to do with whether or not I can declare the word of the Lord to them because the word of the Lord is the only thing that will change it. And when they are confronted with true spirituality and the true power of God, it is amazing how they melt. That is exactly what happened in the Bible almost on every occasion, and it's what we have lost. And I believe 
that Charleston and South Carolina and our nation and the world needs a renewal of spirit-filled distinctives. They need a group of devil-chasing, tongue-talking, spirit-filled people. I've had people make fun of me because I pray in the spirit. I'm telling you, I no longer care about these things anymore. My, my feeling is this. If there are 6,000 languages in the earth, what's one more language that might exist in a nation called heaven? And why are you so arrogant to believe that God doesn't have a language in his nation right now that you don't know? I believe it's not only possible, it's a reality, and I practice it daily. We don't apologize for these things. People go, I don't even know what to pray about. Have you ever heard a friend go, I don't even know how to pray about this? Ha <laughs> ha, I do. I know exactly how to pray about it. The Holy Spirit can pray through me. And you know what? We'll agree together. We will stand in faith. We will pray the power of God down. We will deliver that person from that devil. We will run Satan out of this situation. We are unashamed of our distinctives. And I'm all for a city church, but it's not a city church. Listen, and I know the bishop's heart in this, so I'm not saying anything he would not say amen to. But I have watched, and you have watched too, how we will gather together and we will all fall to the lowest common denominator. And it usually is the cessationist who's dead as a doornail, who doesn't want to be challenged in his spiritual life, and he's deadheaded. And I'm telling you, that is not the church Jesus wants. The church Jesus wants is filled with his spirit, on fire, passionate, worshiping God all out. And when people come in, they say things like, surely God is in this place. That's what God is doing. That's the city church. That's what I'm signing up for, and that's what I believe God wants to restore. He's not trying to get us back to the Church of Acts. He's trying to do something greater than the Church of Acts. That's just the foundation. We can't even get our foundation right, which is why we can't, be, but we must rebuild what we know to rebuild. And if we will rebuild it, if we rebuild it, He will come. And I'm not talking about more bricks and mortar. I'm talking about rebuilding the people that will get on their knees and put their faces before God and weep between the porch and the altar and pray and seek God and cry out for revival and will bear the stigma of being in a flood zone, will bear the stigma of being tongue talkers, of bearing the stigma of being these spirit-filled, crazy, fanatical people. If we will bear the stigma and do these things, if we rebuild it, they, he will come. I'm preaching myself beyond my vocabulary. <sighs> I got to stop there. Brad, bring your people back up. I want to sing before we go. That's what I should have called it. If we rebuild it, he will come. I remember years ago, we, uh, we had purchased that piece of property out on John's Island. Still have it, still, still servicing it. But I remember in those early days, we, uh, we had an architect that uh, came and we were visiting with, trying to move forward. And uh, he, he, he was sharing with me, and we laugh about it because it comes from Field of Dreams, uh, the saying, if you build it, they will come. It's when they were building the field, uh, baseball field out in the cornfield. If you build it, they will come. And, uh, and uh, he was sharing with me, and he said, you know, there really is a truth to that. He said, uh, the architect said to me, you know, there's something about a building. If people, if, if you build a building, people just get interested in that. And they come to it. And I said, well, that's, that's an interesting dynamic. It was all natural, though. Hear me, this was all natural. You know, it's like if you build a new restaurant, everybody wants to go to the new restaurant. Or you build a new, a new mall or a new area, everybody wants to go to that. But, but hear me when I give you the spiritual principle. If we rebuild what we know built the early church. And what did they do when they came together? They prayed, they fellowshiped, uh, they, uh, they went over the apostles' doctrine, heard preaching, teaching, worshiped God. I mean, all the things that I just shared with you. 
and God would show up in an amazing way. Simple things. And I just believe in that simplicity. If we'll commit in a, in a dedicated way to rebuild the simple things that God will come and restore above and beyond all that we could have asked or thought. Think about that in your own life. If, if you would simply rebuild some things, simple things that you know to do, would you rebuild? We, we, we talk about in this, our household, we've been married 35 years and we haven't done it perfectly at every moment along the way, but I can tell you there, th we know we have date nights and we, we do things together as a couple and it's just really simple stuff. And if you'll do the simple things, God comes and restores if you'll rebuild it. Will you rebuild some of the simple things? Commitment to praying, certainly personally, corporate prayer. Would you commit to praising and worshiping God that when you come here every single Lord's Day, that you're coming in not to be carried along by everyone else, but that you will worship God? Had someone once say they, they thought church was dead. I said, church is dead. And, 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 and I, did, I didn't say this to them, but church isn't dead. You're dead. Church is alive. You're dead. You're wanting us to do something that makes you feel alive. What you need to do is you need to purpose to step into worshiping your God. And if you would do that, God would be a restorer to you. You be there. You need preaching. You need teaching. For no other reason, there's something unique God does in it that just lifts you up and encourages you. You need that. And folks, we need to start practicing, participating in our spirit-filled distinctive and roots. It's easy. It's easy to get sucked along in a seeker-sensitive age. We love lost people. We love people seeking the Lord. But here's the deal. They need to know the power of God. They need someone that can pray through. They need someone that when they lay hands on them can get them healed. Listen, no more ashamedness for our spirit-filled distinctives. And if we will rebuild on those simple concepts, watch God restore in an amazing way. Hey, stand with me. Holy Spirit, we honor you in this place. We honor you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Lord, I'm praying right now that you would work here in your people. This is your people. This is the first fruit of the city church. The first fruit. Lord, bear much fruit from this offering that many might come to know you that many might see you, experience you, that families and family trees would be forever altered. I'm praying, Lord, that you would do a work so profound that a region would be touched. Lord, not for our sake or for our name, but that, that your name might be made great. Lord, we thank you for all the work that you've done in days past those foundations that have been laid, we appreciate it and we esteem it. Lord, establish us in those truths, but cause us now to hunger and thirst for that which you yet desire to do. Lord, we pray that you would work in us. And even on this first day in this unusual situation, Lord, that you would use all of this to strengthen your people, that this would become your throne zone and that, Lord, people would just be inexplicably, strangely drawn here in order that they might come to know you. Lord, let your church arise. Let your church arise, I pray. And we're just going to love you and obey you with everything we've got. Hallelujah. Release the power.